Hashem. We're going to have a little look at, at, at it's Rosh Chodesh today. <clears throat> so we're going to have a little, little, little <laughs> we'll try again. We'll have a little look at Rosh Chodesh. Um, the, first of all, where, where does Rosh Chodesh come from? Um, so it's kind, of, it's kind of neat because, you know, we just, we just had Shabbos Bereshis. And over there, there's a rather interesting little instance. The, you know, the, the uh, Chazal and Midrashim talk about that when God created the sun and the moon, so if you take a look, it's, you know, they were, they were big, great big balls of, uh, of uh, sources of light. And the moon comes to God and says to God, It's not possible for two kings to use one crown. Right? You've got the sun gives light in the day and the moon gives light at night. And uh, it seems clear from the description of the, uh, of the, uh, of the creation and certainly from the dialogue that takes place now between the moon and God, that the moon was giving off light, a lot of light, not like today, we'll see in a minute. So God says to the moon, okay, you know what, you're right, make yourself small, and, uh, and that'll take care of the problem. Right? So I think, first of all, there's a little lesson over here, that, you know, maybe, maybe don't complain. Stick to the matters you have. I guess, I guess so, right? <laughs> and if you really can't swing it, then swap with your roommates whilst he's not there or something. But mm. <clears throat> the, the, uh, so the moon, <clears throat> the moon then says to God, it's interesting, God, God's not saying that it's not true what you're saying, right? It's not that God's coming and arguing with the moon and saying, you know what, that's a ridiculous assumption. If I made you both the size that I made you, then it, obviously it's clear that's what you're supposed to be. But rather God says, okay, you know what, you're right. So make yourself smaller. So the moon then comes back to God and says, but hold on a second, what, what, you know, why am I being penalized for drawing to your attention something which is clear? So God then says, you know what, you're right again. And I'm going to give you the stars as a, some kind of a compensation. And, and actually, according to, according to the sages, if you take, they, say, they say if you take the light of the moon and the light of the stars together, it equals the light of the sun. It's just it's not as powerful because the stars are spread out all over the place. So it's it's uh, you know it's been spread thin. <clears throat> so I saw actually I saw a very interesting idea. Um, if if what the if what the moon is saying is true, so why is the moon being penalized? That was a, a question, by the way. I just I, I don't want to you know frighten anybody over here. Mm. This is the penalty. It's the moon was never meant to uh, have the same role. Otherwise, it would be bright all the time and no one would be able to sleep. Okay, so what are you saying? You're saying it's not a penalty. You're saying it's just a. It's, uh, it's just being uh, better equipped for its role. Ooh, huh? that's very nice, actually. Why would the moon question the creation? Period. I mean, that's uh, that's my question. I, I think, you know what, we're going we're gonna to tie your question together with, with what you just said, I think. Because obviously there's a necessity over here, there's a necessity for the moon to have a certain potential. And for that potential to be taken and to be reduced, but to be spread out as well. Right? There, there is a lesson over here of, of uh, you know, under, understanding your place and reaching your potential in the, in the correct way. Which means that it seems that the question, the question that the sun is asking the moon is a valid, and the question that the moon is asking God <coughs> is that it's a valid question, right? <clears throat> what, what's he saying? You know, you can't have two people fulfilling the same function. Can you imagine it in a job? You've got two people doing exactly the same thing. What, what do you need them for? Right. You know, make one more senior, make one less senior. But, you know, what, what's the point of having these two people doing exactly the same thing? Right. Uh, the moon didn't offer a solution. That's interesting. The moon didn't offer a solution, which is, you know, it's fascinating. You know where, you know where it says that much later on? There's a, there's a Torah portion called Yitro, yeah. where Yitro comes to Moshe Rabbeinu and he says to Moshe Rabbeinu, look, you know, it's, it's the whole thing that Moshe Rabbeinu spends all day dealing with judging the people. And, uh, and Yitro comes at the end of the day and he says, you know, you can't, you can't do this. What, every day you're going to sit here and you're going to judge the people? You know, the, you're going to get exhausted. The people will get exhausted. And then he gives a whole, he gives a whole uh, um, idea of what to do. Right? He offers a whole solution to have a hierarchy of judges, right? 
and to make one person in charge of 10 and one person in charge of 50 and one person in charge of 100. And that way, it will relieve the pressure from Moshe Rabbeinu. So I once saw, I don't remember where I saw it, but one of the early authorities says what you just said. Why, why, did, why did Yitro merit to have a Torah portion named after him? Not because he, <clears throat> not because he pointed out the problem, but because he offered a solution, which means we can all point out problems, right? We can all point out what's not, not good, yeah? But pointing out what's no, not good and identifying what can be done in order to help that, right, in order to make it better, that's something which really is a, a great idea. So, okay, that's a great idea. Maybe part of the problem over here is that the moon didn't offer any solutions. It's not enough to come to God and say, you know, you can't, it's like coming to the boss and saying, look, you know, me and him, we're doing exactly the same job. So what do you suggest? So you know what? The boss would probably be perfectly in his rights to say, you know what? You're quite right. I'm going to promote him, and you can stay in the position that you're in, right? Or worse, I'm going to keep him in the position that he's in, and I'm going to reduce your, your, uh, your job, right? How would, how would we deal with the, I mean, I don't know, the fact that really the moon is illuminated by the sun? Is there any, anything in that? Yes, very much so. You know what, we'll cut, let, let's come to it a little bit later on. Let's just, just, just deal with this thing over here. I saw a very beautiful idea not very, not, 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 not very, I'm not doing very well today, not very long ago, right, which says like this, that um, the, uh, the problem, the problem with, the, why was the moon penalised and the sun not? What made God choose the moon and not the sun? Because the moon was bothered by it. The sun wasn't bothered by it, right? Which is interesting, you've got two people doing exactly the same job. The one who comes and says, look, what's going on over here? We're both doing the same job. He's bothered by the fact that there's two of them. The other one's not bothered. So the boss will say to himself, you know what, hold on a second. If it bothers you, so fine, let's make a differentiation over here and we'll give you less of a responsibility and you'll get less of a salary. And this one over here wasn't bothered by anything, so let him continue, right? I'm sorry so, to ask, where are, we, where are we reading this again? From which? From the Medrash. From the Medrash, okay. Um, just, just, you know what, so I'm going to tie it into what you said, right? I think like this, if the person comes to the boss and he says, look, you know, this is ridiculous. Me and him are doing the same job. So I've got, a, I, I've got an idea, right? I'm not asking for more money, but you know what? There's a thing over here that needs to be taken care of as well, right? So let me, I'll take care of that as well. So he's not only coming and pointing out what the problem is, pointing out what, you know, he's got a solution over here as well, in the hope that the boss will realize how dedicated this fellow is, right? And then he'll, maybe he'll give him a promotion. But if you come without any kind of solution whatsoever, you're just pointing out what the problem is, so you're opening up the possibility for something happening that you don't want to have happen. Are we, when we do the Kaj de Lavana, is it because of the Lavana or because of the new month? Because... Uh, it's really, it's really both. It's really, it's tied yeah, up but, together. But he did get some covered. Oh, so sure, it says like this. Not only did God say, I'll give you the stars, right? But God said, the Jewish year will follow the lunar cycle. <clears throat> Which means that even though it looks to us like the moon has got the raw end of the deal over here, but really, as yeah. far as we're concerned, yeah, inside of our Jewish identity, we need the moon much more than we need the sun. I mean, the sun is there to keep us warm and the sun is there to bring us energy and heat. I understand that, for sure. I'm not talking on a, on a practical basis right now. I'm talking on a spiritual basis. We live according to the cycle of the moon. Which means that God gives the moon a dimension which it didn't have before by... So how's this for an idea? I'm just thinking out loud. I just thought about this just now, right? But let's, let's see if it works. God reduces the physical dimension of the moon and enhances the spiritual dimension of the moon. Right? Here, listen. What, what do you think about that idea? I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud, but I think, I, think there's a, I think there's a beautiful idea over here. I really do. A Kodesh Boch who reduces the physical dimension of the moon and makes it a more spiritual dimension. There's a little, like a little lesson over here, right? That for us, that in order to become... More, more familiar, to be more tapped into the spiritual, so maybe it, maybe it does need letting go a little bit of the physicality in order to recognize the more spiritual dimensions that exist over here. So here, let's have a look at something else, and we'll start building, start building something very beautiful over here. The, the, uh, the sages, Chazal, say that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is analogous to the sun. 
And the sun never changes. The sun is completely consistent 365 days of the year. The Jewish nation is analogous to the moon. Right? How does it work? So we see there are two very important dimensions of the moon which are going to attach us to the Jew, which is going to attach itself to the Jews. The first one is that the moon has no independent source of light of its own, which means that it gets all of its light is a reflection of the sun, which is what that's what our function is here. Right? We as Jews, that's our function here in this physical world to bring God's light down into the world, which is why there's a very famous phrase that's found in the prophets called an orla goyim. The Jewish people are supposed to be a light unto the nations. Right? How do we get to be a light unto the nations? By reflecting the light of God, by bringing God's spirituality down into the world. There's another dimension which is very that very connected to the Jews and to Jewish history is the fact that the moon waxes and wanes. And the moon grows for 15 days, it grows for 15 days, it becomes smaller and smaller. Jewish history reflects that. <coughs> Jewish history, you know, we grow, we become powerful, we become, we become something very great that brings that spiritual dimension down into the world and then we start losing our spiritual connection and we start waning. I pointed out here once a while ago, but it's such an incredible idea. It's just it's worth hearing it again. It really is. <clears throat> that that um, there are 15 generations from Avram Avinu until the building of the first temple, until Ki until King Solomon. 15 generations, which they correspond to the 15 days of the month that the moon grows. Avram Avinu is a nascent beginning of the Jewish people. And we grow and grow and grow until the zenith of the Jewish history was King Solomon, the first temple. Right? There were over miracles taking place. You know, it was unbelievable what happened in the time of King Solomon in the first temple. It was a, a semi-messianic era. So you've got 15 days of the moon that correspond to 15 generations where the moon grows and the Jewish people grow. And then after King Solomon, there are 15 generations that take you to the destruction of the first temple. And that corresponds to the 15 days of the month where the moon is waning and waning and becoming smaller and smaller until it finally disappears. Right? Which means that the moon represents, it, re it represents us and we represent the moon. Right? <clears throat> We're joined together. And that's why the months are... Jewish, the Jewish months are all lunar months, right? And that's why, if you know anything about how long a lunar month is, it's really 29 and a half days long. And that's why Rosh Chodesh, which we're in today, is sometimes two days and sometimes one day. Normally they switch off. So this month is two days, next month will be one day. Why is that? Because the, new, the month is really 29 and a half days long. So Rosh Chodesh this month will be for two days. Next month it'll be for one day. And they'll measure each other out, which means that the month will be 29, month, 29 days long or 30 days long. And each month will, will balance out Rosh the other Rosh. one. Today is Rosh Chodesh, yeah. Which I'm sure you must have realized when you were in shul and, uh, you know, praying like the clappers. So you're here. So that, that's, that's the dimension of what makes Rosh Chodesh so incredibly important to us is that this is how we are going to count our... We're going to account our identity over here. We're going to find our identity, Jewish identity, through the months that we move into. Sorry, Rosh Chodesh is like um, the beginning of the month? Rosh Chodesh is the beginning of the month. So Rosh means the head, and Chodesh means month. Right? So Rosh Chodesh is the beginning of the month, and here, right now, today is Rosh Chodesh, and tomorrow will be Rosh Chodesh, because today is the 30th day of the month, and tomorrow is the first day of the month. Why is, <coughs> it, always not two, why is it not always two days? Here, because then, you, then you'll have too much. What next month? So what will happen next month is that the month will be 29 days long. Oh, okay. And then the first day of the month will be Rosh Chodesh. Right, okay. And it, again, that's how it balances itself out, because really it's 29 and a half days long. So okay. this month is 30 days long, next month is 29 days long. Right, the, right. Does uh, the two days correspond with when the new moon was seen on the, first, on the 29th? No, interestingly yeah. enough, the, the, uh, the, the, the moilid, the birth of the new moon, which was, I can't I remember, it was, it's today, it's, I think it was this morning, 
is the beginning, the beginning where you, you, can't, you can't see the new moon at its very beginning. <clears throat> that, that sliver of banana, right? Right, Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning, that's what I remember. Yeah? The very beginning of the month, the very beginning of that new moon, you can't see it. And it becomes a mitzvah shem. At some point we'll talk about the concept of Kiddush Levana, which has to be done when, when the moon is able to be seen in the sky. Right, and that's that's going to be a little bit a little bit later on. Rosh Chodesh is in Hashemayim, or I mean, of the Rabban. I mean, no, Rosh Chodesh is coming from Hakadosh Baruch Hu. It says like this: Hakadosh, the very first mitzvah that God gave. Oh, has this? It's going to fit in beautifully. The very first mitzvah that God gave to the Jewish people when they were still in Egypt, just before we left, is Achodesh Azeh Lachem. That this month is the, the the months are for you. Achodesh Azeh Lachem. The sages teach that God taught Moshe Rabbeinu how to identify the new moon, right? How to, how to realize where it's supposed to be because the moon also moves around in the sky. It's not always in the same place. So you've got to be able to identify where it is and what it looks like in order to be able to say that the new moon is now taking, it's now a new month. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says like this, most incredible idea, that the month is for you, God is giving over the... The, the koach, the power of the month, is being given over to the Jewish people. Only by seeing the moon. Only yeah. by seeing the moon, which so means... Why do we need Aedis for, you know... Oh, very good, right? The truth of the matter is that there's no need for witnesses to come to Jerusalem to say that they saw the moon and for the Sanhedrin to say there's going to be a Rosh Chodesh because they knew exactly when it was supposed to be anyway. Here, Hillel II... Not, not the famous Hillel, but his grandson wrote the calendar that we're using today was written 2,000 years ago. Right? Which means that they knew perfectly well when the new moon was and they knew exactly when it was going to be seen and they knew exactly when Rosh Chodesh was. <clears throat> All of this was being done in order to publicize the fact that there's a Rosh Chodesh. So God says, no, bring witnesses and they should come and they should testify. And then you'll pronounce that there's a new moon. And the Gemara says the most astonishing thing. If a mistake is made, <clears throat> let's say, for example, they come and they pronounce that today is Rosh Chodesh. The witnesses came to Jerusalem. They came to the temple and they gave their testimony. And a mistake was made somewhere. And they didn't accept the testimony. And then they, the next day it was declared a new month. Now, it may not sound like such a big deal to you people, but it really is an enormous deal. Why is that? Because if you imagine that, let's say, for example, it's the month of Tishrei or the month of Nisan, where we're talking about the, the festivals, right? Well, the, festival, the festivals are all Torah obligations. When God says that, you know, that Pesach has to be on the 15th of Nisan, and if the, if the sages make a mistake and they call it the 15th of Nisan, but it's really the 16th of Nisan, well, what's going to be with Pesach? That really is Pesach or it's not Pesach. So listen to what the Gemara, the Gemara says the most astonishing thing. God says that if a mistake is made, a genuine mistake is made, then God says, I'll go along with it. Mm -hmm. Which means that if they make a mistake and they make the 15th of Nisan instead of the, you know, they make it on the 16th instead of on the, on the uh, 15th, God says, you know what, fine, okay, so that'll be the 15th of Nisan. In the Shemaim as well, we're going to keep everything in tandem. What's the idea? The idea is that the months belong to us. The months are ours in order for us to keep, to keep in a state of you know, growth. We're going to grow and we're going to connect together with God. And that's one of the reasons why a month in Hebrew is called Chodesh. Because Chodesh comes from the word Chadash. Right? New, right? The idea of It Chadshut. It Chadshut is renewal. Yeah, here it's, the most, it's the most beautiful idea that the, the months represent the concept of renewal. That within the month we're going to renew ourselves and we're going to grow and we're going to grasp the various dimensions and concepts that each month represent. So that's another idea. <clears throat> the, the months are not just, you know, one month following another month. I mean, that happens. That's a physical, that's a practical dimension. But each month has its own dimension. It's got its own concept that the month is 
made up of. It's got its own power, it's got its own energy to it. So, for example, the month of Tishrei is the month of, interestingly enough, both Din, judgment, and Simcha from, from uh, Sukkot. <clears throat> Which means that the month itself is a month that's comprised of the energy of Din and Simcha. The, the month of Nisan, where Pesach is, is a month of Geula. It's got the redemption inside of it. It's a month which the essence of the month is the concept of redemption. That's one of the reasons why the Gemara says that we were redeemed in Nisan and we will be redeemed in the future in Nisan. I don't think it means that we'll be redeemed necessarily in the month of Nisan. We can be redeemed today. But I think what it's coming to teach us is what? That that, that energy of redemption is something which is particular to the month of Nisan. We now moved into the month of what's called Mar Cheshvan. What is Mar Cheshvan? So the month that we're in right now, Cheshvan is a very interesting month. You know why? Why is it interesting? Because it's got no holidays in it. We, we've got holidays all over the place, right? So for in Tishrei, which we've just been through, I mean, the whole, the whole month is full of holidays, right? We, but we've got Cheshvan has nothing. Kislev has Chanukah. Tishrei, uh, Kis Tevet has the end of Chanukah inside of it. And then you've got um, Shvat, which is the month of the New Year of the Trees. And then you've got Adar, which is the month of Purim. And then you've got Nisan, which is the month of Pesach. And then you've got Ia, which is the month of Pesach Sheni, the second Pesach. And then you've got Sivan, which is the month of Shavuos. Then you have Tammuz, which also doesn't have a, a holiday inside of it. And then you have Av, which has got two very important days inside of it. One of them, of course, is Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, which emits Hashem, when the Mashiach comes, will turn into a Yom Tov. And the other one is the 15th of Av, which is considered to be a very, very joyous day. If we're saying that Av has Tisha B'Av and Tammuz has... Oh, so why, it's not that Tammuz doesn't really have anything. It does, but we've got to wait until the Mashiach comes in order, you know, the same build-up that we have between the, those three weeks, between the 17th of Tammuz and the 9th of Av, that bring us from, you know, being, being in a state of mourning to a state of great mourning, when the Mashiach comes, it should come very, very soon, right? But when the Mashiach comes, that will all turn into a time of joy. We'll get, it's going to build us up. That, those three weeks will build us up into the most incredible time of joy and simcha. Right? That's something to look forward to. <coughs> Mar Cheshvan. One of the reasons why Cheshvan is called Mar Cheshvan. What, what does Mar mean? It's bitter. Bitter, right? Mar means bitter. Mar means mister as well, but... Uh, Mar, Mar means bitter, right? So one of the reasons that's given why it's called Mar Cheshvan is because there's nothing in it. It's got, it's got no holidays in it, so it's a bitter month. So interesting. So why is it not called Mar Tammuz? I don't know. Maybe, maybe because it's got the potential inside of it when the Mashiach comes to become a time of joy. So we don't call it Mar. Mar Cheshvan, when the Mashiach comes, we're, gonna, we're still going to have a month without any festivals in it. However, there's another, there's another reason which is given. The, the concept of mar is the concept of rain. Drops of rain. The cheshvan is the month where the early rains, that's when they're supposed to fall. It's Hashem, right? It's a bracha. It's a bracha, for sure. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Some people say that it's got that, that dimension of bitterness. Some people say it's got the dimension of referring to the rains. If you read in the, in the second paragraph of the Shema, we talk about the early rains and the latter rains Right, and that's how the crops are supposed to grow, and that's what's going to bring us bounty and plenty. And Emir Hashem, this month, this year will be a, a you know, truly a, a, a very wet and bountiful winter, Emir Hashem. <coughs> and the, the rains will begin to, the rain should begin to fall sometime during the month of Cheshvan. Nishmana Esrei, right? We added the addition for between. Mashivaruach and We started saying now, and Emir Hashem, in a week's time. We're going to start adding in the same Talumata Livracha, which is, it's interesting. Mashavacha Moide Geshem. No, over here in Israel, it's on Zayin Cheshvan. Oh, really? Oh. Oh. The art scroll, it says that December. Because the art, the art yeah. scroll sitter is built for Chutzlaret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, <coughs> we're going to start in Mitzvah Hashem in a week's time. We're going to start saying on Zayin Cheshvan, the seventh of Cheshvan. We're going to start saying the same Talomati Levrocha. It's interesting. What's the difference between the two? So let's have a quick look, even though it's not, it's not related, but it's, it's all related, right? Yeah. Okay, so Mashiva Ochumoda Geshe means that God brings the winds and he brings the rain. Okay, cool. Right? And we start, we start adding that in from the yeah, end of Sukkot, right. we start adding it into the Amidah. Uh, it brings, why, why the, no? it it brings the wind and Pardon? drops the rain. It brings, brings the wind and drops the rain. Excuse me. Why do the additions come for the uh, for the P dance? So, <laughs> what? How come the why, why, why do the additions appear at different times? Oh, here, very good, right? <clears throat> here, so keep keep an eye on that for a minute. I'll explain what's going on. When we say Geshem, right? When we make that change over on Sukkot from saying that God gives us due to God. Brings the it brings the wind and drops the rain, right? <laughs> we are we are not we're not asking for rain at that point. We're just making a statement of fact, which means when you read through the Amidah at the, at the beginning, yeah. the first opening brachot, all we're doing really is defining who God is, right? Why why are we why are we doing this? Why are we turning to God? Why are we praying to God? We're defining who God is. So God <coughs> is the God of Abraham. He revives the dead. You know, all of, the, all of these incredible dimensions that we need to know that this is a person that we're turning to to ask for our requests. So when we say, he brings the wind and drops the rain of Mashiv Rochamodegesh, we're not asking for anything. We're just making a statement of fact. That's what God does. Later on in the Amidah, in the Brocha of Barach Aleinu, which is a Brocha of Parnassah, that we should have a livelihood, right? that we should be blessed with material wealth, over there we say the same Talomata Levracha, we ask God to give us rain. That's a request. So the Gemara wants to know, right? The Gemara really asks a very, a very important question. The Gemara says, why do we start saying Mashiva Ochomada Geshev at Sukkot? And then we wait two weeks until we start the saying the words, the same Talomata Levracha, which is asking for rain. The answer says the Gemara like this. Because all the Jews came to Jerusalem for Sukkot, right? It's one of the one of the foot festivals, one of the pilgrim festivals. Everyone was in Jerusalem for Sukkot. It took a minimum of two, it took a maximum of two weeks for the Jews to get beyond the Euphrates River. Naha Prat. After that, what was the problem? The minute it started raining, if it started raining heavily, then it would become very difficult to get across the river. First of all, the river blanks would flood, everything would become muddy. So the rabbis instituted that we wait two weeks to allow all the people that have come to Jerusalem to be able to, the ones that had the furthest to travel, had to travel over the Euphrates River to get back home again, that they should be able to get beyond the Euphrates before they start reciting the bracha asking for rain. You hear? It's a very beautiful idea. Oh, here, hold on, a, just hold on a second. We'll get to that as well, right? So far, so good, right? That's why we're going to wait now. It's in a week's time. It's going to be two weeks after Sukkot, right? Zayin Cheshvan, the seventh of Cheshvan. That's when we're going to start saying the extra part in the in the in the Brach of Baruch Aleinu of the Saint Talmud Levracha. So far, so good. And Moshe is concerned about what's going on outside of Israel. Outside of Israel, they start reciting the same Talmud Levrocha inside of the Amida. They wait a long time until the 4th or the 5th of December. First of all, for anybody who's paying attention, right, this is the only time in the Jewish year that we use a non-Jewish date. Yeah, that's true. It goes according to the 4th or the 5th of December outside of Israel. I have a question. When did... Um Rosh Hashanah was the first of Tishrei, right? Yeah. So, when, when was the time frame of Elul from? Rosh Hashanah was what, the... F- Elul, did you say? Rosh Hashanah. Elul, Elul is the month that comes before Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is the month of Tishrei. Elul is the month that precedes it. What, what, what's the question? Because I felt like Elul was kind of short before Rosh Hashanah came. Like, I felt like it went by kind of quick. Oh, no, that's... That, it, 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 I mean, El, Elul was... The full, it was a full amount of days. It it's was. just that because you were coming to this class, you know, every day, it just flew past. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's... 
I guess I was confused because we were still reading that uh, the little paragraph of David. Oh, we keep going. That's right. We keep going until the end of Sukkot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a whole. It's a whole of Elul plus almost the whole of Tishrei as well. Ah, it's right. It's, it's a little bit confusing because you think that it's you think it's being read in order to get ready for Rosh Hashanah, and then you carry on reading it afterwards. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, but okay. Now, now we're back to normal though. Well, normal. I mean, in Judaism, normal is a relative a relative term. So, long. so why why outside of Israel? Why are we bringing in the fourth and the fifth of December? Why are we going according to a secular date? And why is it on the fourth or the fifth of December? Why isn't it just on one of them? Like, what's the difference? So the answer is like this. It's very interesting. The, uh, there is something called Tkufat Tishrei, that the, the year is split up into four sections, like the four seasons. I think you have e equinoxes, right? Are there uh, two equinoxes and two solstices, something like that. I can't yeah. remember. How does it work? That's right. But the, the, the secular, the, the, the solar year is split up into four sections as well, which is where the four seasons come from. Um, again, for, you know, for people who are living in an agricultural community, the four seasons are far more important, for example, than the weeks are. Mm. Now, you know, what, you've got to know what season you're in, you've got to know what you're planting, you've got to know, you've got to know what needs to be done. Right? All of these things are far, far more important than you know, whether, what, not, what number of week you're in at any one given time. Um, in Judaism as well, right? the old, old Jewish communities over here in Israel, everything was agricultural. And there are also four sections of the year. And we're, Tkufat Tishrei is the Tkufa, this period that we're in right now, which I guess corresponds, give or take, corresponds to the concept of what we call autumn and what everyone else seems to call fall. Um, I don't know why, but apparently, yeah. that's, apparently that it's spelled F-A-L-L -L and not F-O-O-L. That's... Is there a prayer in England, in London, for a son? <laughs> <laughs> there's, no, there's no prayer per se, but there is a tradition that fathers pass over to their children that above the clouds somewhere there is this great big ball called the sun. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a tradition. Did you see that before? Mm -hmm. the oh, I thought you were going to say a cup of tea is also a tradition. Well, a cup of tea is something which is a little bit, I've got a little bit more of a practical dimension to it in England. <laughs> at, least, at least you can see it. Um, in all events... The, say the yeah, in, in a minute, we'll see, we'll, see, we'll see why. In a minute, in a minute. In a minute. <laughs> when, when, you, when you recite the prayer for the rain, even, even in England, right, you are reciting the prayer, really your kavana, your intent <laughs> needs to be for here in Israel. So we'll see a fascinating thing over here, right? Outside of Israel, you start reciting that extra prayer for rain on the 4th or the 5th of December because it is 60 days after the equinox. Right? What's called in Hebrew, Tkufat Tishrei, the period of Tishrei. That 60 day, that, that's 60 days at which point the winter has to begin. In all... In all countries in the northern hemisphere, the winter needs to have begun by then, and that's when we start reciting the blessing for the rain. Here in Israel, we start reciting it much earlier because we need rain much earlier on. Why is it the 4th or the 5th of December? Because it depends on whether it's a leap year or not. That's going to have a, it's going to make a difference to the 60th day of the equinox, right, because the whole year has got an extra day inside of it. You mean like a Gregorian leap year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. which means that up, up, what will happen is either under normal circumstances, if it's not a Gregorian leap year, so we'll say it on the 4th of December, they'll start saying it in England, right, or, or outside, of, outside of Israel. Otherwise, it will be on the 5th, because an extra day has been added in to the year. However, what is fascinating about all of this, I'm sorry this is a little bit confusing, but I, I find this fascinating, and therefore I insist that you listen to it. It's my class, so I define what's fascinating, right? Yeah. Don't, yeah, don't forget that. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, what's fascinating about this whole business is that up until not so very long ago, we're going back maybe a, you know several hundred years, each community would decide when they wanted to start reciting the extra prayer for rain outside of Israel from 
Zion Cheshvan from the time that they start in Israel until the 4th or the 5th of December. And we've got a, here, we've got a period. What, what, where, are we, where are we holding now? It's, it's now, so in a week's time, it's going to be the 20th of October, which means we've got like six weeks. It's like a six-week period within which communities would start reciting the prayer according to their own needs. You hear? <clears throat> which means that if you lived in a, a very wet area, so you would, you would push off reciting the blessing until the 4th or the 5th of December. If you lived in a drier area around, the, you know, around, around Israel somewhere, you would probably start reciting it straight away. But Other areas in France, for example, where sometimes it's wetter and sometimes oh. it's drier, each year they would decide when they were going to start reciting the prayer until only about 180 years ago everything became uniform and here in Israel, they start reciting from two weeks after Sukkot. And outside of Israel, everyone starts reciting on the 4th or the 5th of December. But they're all supposed to have in mind that they're saying the prayer for Israel. Yeah, which means the prayer, the prayer is, it's, got like a, a, it's got a duality to it. You're praying for yourself and you're praying for Israel as well. Why, where, where is the real repercussion over here? The real repercussion over here is for somebody that lives in the Southern Hemisphere. Right, in the southern hemisphere, when we hit the winter, it's their summer. So what are they going to do? They're going to pray for rain. They don't want rain in their summer. It's not good to have the rain in the summer. They need the rain in the winter. So it's a whole form of inside of the inside of the uh, uh, you know halach inside of the authorities, the various uh, authorities about when they should begin reciting the prayer for rain. Ultimately, in play, you know the Jewish communities in Australia. And in New Zealand, start reciting the prayer for the rain on the 4th and the 5th of December, just like everybody else. And their kavana is only, their intent is only for the land of Israel, right? Because the land of Israel needs the rain desperately. Thank you. <laughs> no, Rav Moshe has been coming well, for years now. That's the first time he's ever said that. Yeah, so. Why do we have to have a change like that? Where can we have it from the way it's done in Israel? Because really, really, it comes down to the idea of, of, you know, in agricultural societies, it's very difficult for people to pray for rain when they don't need it. That's why the 4th and the 5th of December, it really, that's already the winter time. So you, do, you need the rain anyway, wherever you are in the Northern Hemisphere, you're going to need the rain at that point. It's going to make it easier for everyone to be able to pray with the correct kavana. It's true that in the Southern Hemisphere, it's a, it's a rather strange, I mean, I've never been there, but I would imagine it's a rather strange feeling to be reciting the prayer for rain in the middle of the summer. Outside of Israel, why would we ask for rain around December time? Because the, the idea, again, it's the idea of the 60th day of the equinox is yeah. considered to be a, a when it comes to, when it comes to the, the winter, that's considered to be a very important moment, agriculturally. But it's not typically dry in that time of year. Maybe I'm just coming from a British well, perspective. Well, it does, really does depend where you're coming from. Okay. You know, but again, if you take, you take Europe in general, yeah. so going down into Spain and France, yeah. southern parts of France and certainly in Spain, at that point, that's, that's when the winter is going to start beginning. Isra England, England, of course, is blessed with an abundance of rain, even though they seem to always suffer from droughts in the summer. There's not enough water and water rationing. And people cannot wash their cars or wash themselves or whatever. Oh, you know what? Just before we finish, that there is there is a uh, there's a custom by the women that they take upon themselves. It's like it's like a it's like a minor festival. And they're you know they're careful. You know some, some women are careful not to do all kinds of things, so they won't do, they don't do washing and they don't do sewing. Um, and that actually comes down. Interesting enough, that relates back to the sin of the golden calf. When the sin of the golden calf, the women did not sin. Only the men sinned. And as a, as a, uh, um, a reward, God gave them this, the concept of Rosh Chodesh, this, of being like a, like a festival for them, for the women, that they should be able to you know, have a little, a little bit of a rest and to enjoy, and I guess, to, again, to rejuvenate a little bit and to renew themselves. I think I missed the answer earlier. With, when uh, during certain hedging times, uh, they would either see it on the first day and announce it then, or they would see it on the, see it on the second day and they really didn't need to announce it because everyone knew it was going to be the second day. Uh, does it, which one corresponds to one day and which corresponds to two days? No, neither, <coughs> neither of them actually. In the olden days, when the temple was extant and the witnesses were coming, 
there weren't one or two days worth of Rosh Chodesh. When the witnesses came, they would, they would <laughs> proclaim Rosh Chodesh, and that day would become Rosh Chodesh. Uh -huh. It's only afterwards that, <clears throat> when, when they're trying to, trying to sort out, trying to sort out the, uh, the, the um, calendar without the witnesses and without the sightings of the new moon, then at that point it was created in the way that it was created. Rosh Chodesh, it was an interesting thing. In the temple times, you know, you could, you could be in the temple in the afternoon and all of a sudden they would announce that it's Rosh Chodesh. Right? It had to be done with enough time to be able to offer up the sacrifices that needed to be offered up on that day. But it was something which was, it wasn't, it wasn't something that was, you know, they might have known more or less when it's going to be, but they wouldn't have known that it's going to be exactly on that day because everything is dependent on the witnesses. Witnesses coming and describing the moon that they saw and where they saw it. And then at that point, then they would say, that's it. It's a, it's a new moon, it's a Rosh Chodesh. Right, no, the Levi wouldn't know what songs to sing. Yeah, interestingly enough, you know, there's a custom, you say a psalm of the day every day, right? Every day is a different psalm. According to the Vilna Gon, according to the Grot, there are certain psalms that are recited every, when there's Yom Tov, we don't recite the regular one, we recite something else. <clears throat> However, Shabbos normally overrides. So when, for example, it's Shabbat Cholamoid, the psalm of the day is the psalm of the day for Shabbat, not for, not for whatever, not for the special day, but for Shabbat. <coughs> the exception to the rule is Rosh Chodesh. The Gemara in Sukkah says that the reason why we recite Boruch Nafshi, which is a special psalm of the day for Rosh Chodesh, on Shabbat as well, is to publicize the fact that it's Rosh Chodesh, because it wasn't always known. Even though it's Shabbos. Didn't yeah. you read that last Shabbos? Baruch Nafshi, you might have read it in the afternoon. Yeah, we did. After well, Mincha, because once you, once, you begin the, once you begin the winter, yeah. we stop saying Pirkei Avot, okay. and then they start That's saying Baruch Nafshi okay. instead. Okay. It's, a, it's a little bit shorter. Um, but Baruch Nafshi is also the psalm of the day for Rosh Chodesh. Good, okay, we're going to call it a day again. So that means we've done two days today. Yeah. So I guess I'm off the hook for tomorrow, no? I mean, it's, no? It's a day.